Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of The Leading Issue. I'm Anne Franca, the Chief Executive of the Chartered Management Institute, and today on The Leading Issue, I'm especially delighted to have as my guest Sally Penny, Dr. Sally Penny, MBE. Sally is an incredible all-rounder. She's, of course, a CMI companion. She is a barrister. She is a leading voice in podcasts, in the media. She is the founder of Women in Law. She is a children's book author. Um, and, of course, um, uh, a, a very well-known campaigner, as well as an all-around good egg. So welcome, Sally. Delighted to have you with us today. Thank you, Anne. Thank you so much for introducing me. It doesn't feel like that's all me. <laughs> <laughs> all that and many more, um, including a dog lover and a mother of three. Um, so anyway, you, you are very accomplished. And among other things, you've recently authored a children's book on Black history. Um, tell us, what was the inspiration behind that book? And tell us how it's been received. Oh, well, thank you. Gosh, I didn't think we were going to start with that. So it's lovely. Um, well, you know, Anne, um, the children's books, specifically on black history, came about because I thought it was important for us not only to document Windrush, which has been 75 years since um, people from Caribbean were invited to come to England to rebuild the country after the war, but there is a vast amount of other history. I love history, right? I love American history, Irish history, and I love the makeup of the UK. You know, this tiny island with so much history. But actually, um, I wanted to write a book for all. You know, when people see a black or brown person on the street, you know, they didn't all come on when rush. You know, our history goes back. Uh, English history goes back to Henry VIII, who had a black courtier, for example, a trumpeteer. Yeah. And this guy, not only was he black, but he actually managed to negotiate an increase in his wages. Can you imagine? And he kept his head. I found that fascinating. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah, uh, yeah kept it. But his other history is like that. But it actually was instigated um, a little uh, earlier by the Euro um, uh, football, uh, where, which the men went to the final of the Euros, but didn't win. And um, not the women, because, of course, the women just thought, oh, sod that, we'll do it. So they brought the cup home. But before it, there was a game and it was just in lockdown. And afterwards, there was a vast amount of racism received by three players who um, missed the penalties in the final. In, and they're well-known players. I needn't remind everybody, but people will remember, one of whom was Marcus Rashford, who was a footballer campaigner for Man United. And it was very sad because there's a mural in Manchester where I live. I work in Manchester and London. And people graffitied over this mural, um, you know, racist language. And it was really quite shocking because the mural is just him. And there's a guy that does polite murals. And that act was so horrifying. But you know, the goodness in the great British public People attended and covered that racist language with post-it notes, flowers, posters, saying, keep doing what you're doing. Well done, Marcus. And the same was done for um, Saka, who plays for Arsenal. There wasn't a mural, uh, but he received a lot of abuse, both physically and indeed on online abuse. And I was so inspired by the Marcus Rashford reaction from the public, who were just going, do you know what? We are not all affected by racism, but we're going to cover it with positivity. And I thought, well, isn't that an incentive to document? You know, that's a recent incident, but let's look back at the work of so many others. So that's, and actually the children's book seems to be bought by a lot of managers, Anne, which brings us back to... <laughs> How weird is that? You know, a lot of d and days are people getting in touch with me saying, can we buy bolts of your children's books and can you come and talk to us a bit about inclusion and belonging? I'm thinking, actually, I'm in court most of the time, but I'm delighted the manager's looking at, you know, the wider scope of history and Black History Month, of course, we just had, we're just finishing Pride Month and all these issues. So that's a long answer to a very short question. But there were the reasons I wrote that book and it's, you know, Black History is all our history and the other book is called Where Are You From? Uh, which is illustrated um, by a children's author. So that, those were the reasons, really. And I think it's important for us to know where we come from before we can yeah. progress. You know what I mean? You know, we need to look back before we can actually make meaningful developments. Yeah, I think that's um, that's a really fascinating story. And I think it's also true that 
Um, you know, a lot of this is about simple humanity and common sense and how we treat each other. And of course, children often have a lot more of that before, um, you know, they they uh, grow up and and uh, and take on biases and prejudices of those around them. Yeah. Um, but that's that children's book and that wonderful story is only one half of your media activities. The other half is your uh, very well listened to podcast, Talking Law, which of yeah. course draws on your considerable legal expertise. Um, and what are some of the most memorable conversations that you've had there? Gosh, where do I start? Because, you know, that podcast, just the reason I started it was my producer who knows nothing about the law. She's a journo, right? And she's actually now living in, in Texas with her husband and two children. But she was like, I don't know nothing about the law, but what was it like? I wanted to tell the stories of what it was, it was like for women and men who didn't have traditional roots to the to the law. And and I really, it was kind of for me and for junior people really who might be coming into the into the profession and you know my branch of the profession I wear a wig and gown I'm the Harry Potter end right I'm not a solicitor I'm a barrister so my end is very traditional but I wanted people to really get a feel of what is leadership what's good leadership right mm -hmm. and when they came to the profession who inspired them? Who were the leaders? What did it look like? And what were the voices like of the people? So some of the interesting ones has been Barrett Tale, who of course the public know about because of Brexit and prorogation of Parliament. That's the main reason. And her conversations about her being the first, um, well, the only female president of the Supreme Court, the highest court in, in England. So that, that interview is actually quite interesting, uh, as well as talking about her brooch and how that's become somewhat <laughs> infamous. A spider brooch, right? Yeah, a spider brooch, <laughs> you know, quite infamous, which isn't actually a, a, as expensive as we all think. I think it's like 20 quid from somewhere from her husband. <laughs> um, so that's one of them. Some of the others have been uh, people like David Panic, Lord Panic, mm -hmm. um, who has been a leading barrister for a considerable amount of time and taken... Uh, a great deal of cases which have shaped the law. Uh, and others which have been interesting have been Cherie Blair, people like that, who mm -hmm. have been managing a career while some other and then being a prime minister's wife. You know, and actually when she came to the bar, she said there were very few women. So she never heard women's voices. I mean, how mm -hmm. phenomenal is that to think you would never, you know, hear. And you know, Anne, recently, from a leadership point of view, the Lord Chief Justice in England is a woman. And, she yes. has, well, and it was down to two women, right? There hasn't been a woman holding that post for 755 years. And I'd quite like to interview her because it's significant. Of course, Ireland and Australia were ahead of us. And so that podcast has a million downloads. I don't know who's listening to it. Great. And it's on Apple, Apple Podcasts. But some other people I've had also have been quite fun, like Rob Rinder you know, who is Judge Rinder to people who watch television. Uh, and he talks a lot about... Um, you know, he, leaving the bar, the legal profession, and doing other things. Mm -hmm. And also, really, you know, as, as a gay man, what that was like um, when, when one reflects on it. And so, I mean, there are 80 episodes, so I can't I can't really pick <laughs> favourites. No. Um, but, but some of the ones I found most interesting, and one of my recent ones, is Lord Sumption, who was a Supreme Court um, judge. And he talks a lot about outside interests, so board roles. So he was on the board of ENO, English National Opera, um, Royal Academy of Arts, and, and so on. You know, outside interests and how they have shaped his own interest in the law and assisted him in developing that. And so the podcast has been really, I mean, predominantly women, I would say, that I've interviewed uh, just over. But the careers have been interesting and also focusing on issues like well-being, and mm -hmm. um, you know, the roots. I mean, one of the things I'm passionate about is apprenticeships. And I think mm -hmm. there are, are legal apprenticeships now. But in our sector, both solicitors and barristers, it's not enough and not enough credence is given there. So some of my interviews about are about that. You know, what other route might you have taken? Um, yes. Available. And uh, the apprentice route often comes up. Um, and also... I often ask about leadership and management because, you know, in yes. law, people are appointed into roles that haven't actually had any management role, uh, management training. They haven't been on a CMI or, you know, 
courses. And I'm quite passionate that if we have better managers, we would have less. You've heard me say this before, so forgive me for repeating it. We would have less cases. If we can have absolutely. Cases, yeah. yeah. It's a critical point. So many critical points there. And of course, CMI, we are great believers in apprenticeships. It's mm. practical learning. It's contextualized learning. And we are also about to launch a major management and leadership campaign that's going to underscore exactly what you just said, that if you if we did have more and better trained managers, well, not that we would put you out of work, Sally, but you no, know, indeed have fewer cases uh, because there is a very big correlation between bad management and court cases, as we know. Um, but just dialing back a little bit to some of your comments about women and uh, people from um, ethnic minority, black and uh, other backgrounds. There, what do you make of the current state? You know, you mentioned the first female justice in seven over 700 years. Um, you you uh, talked a little bit about some of the um, reactions in uh, Euro 2020, the racist comments there. Where do you think we are as a nation now when it comes to um, the progress of women and indeed the progress of race relations in the workplace? Well, that, that that's a big question and I'll take them one on either hand if you like. Um, firstly, we have made we have made progress, right? And I think sometimes we're very negative about the progress and the stats that actually can tell us otherwise. In respect of women, you know, the 30% club has shown us that, you know, we've gone over 30%, but of course, a lot of that are not in exec roles. We haven't still haven't got sufficient CEOs. So I'm talking about the top of the food chain. So we've made progress, but we're not quite there yet with sufficient um, uh, leadership of women in those senior roles. Uh, and I think there's still a lot more work to be done. When I look at the, the current cabinet, you know, I have no interest in politics apart from voting. But I, I look because often they're reflections of what's going on in the society. So I do think there's some progress. In my own profession, there is an increase. You know, in law, a third of people doing studying law are women, are young mm -hmm. women. But that is not reflected in partnerships uh, roles at all in the city or otherwise and not quite reflected in the judicial appointments. So I, I think we are progressing, we should celebrate it, but let's not celebrate the wrong things. You know, there's a woman has never held a role of Lord Chief Justice and it went down to the two women on the shortlist. So, you know, that ought to be celebrated that there was a pool, but that sounds to me like there was only a pool of two. You know, come on, it's 2023, we can do better. And on mm -hmm. race, well, today, Anne, came the report from England Cricket. Uh, and crikey, where do we start? You know, saying that not only was this racism and sexism in England in port, but also there was a class issue because of course, social mobility, this is Britain, right? If you compare us to other parts of Europe or all the States, you know, class doesn't seem to have as much of a play in those, but in England, it does. And that's what that, I haven't read all of it um, uh, fully, but I, I've read the important and pertinent parts. So that tells us that whilst Port has an ability to unite, actually it, our record on race still isn't great. There still aren't very many managers, for example, managing sports teams, not just football, which is, you know, the popular sport, but cricket really does highlight a big shame for us. So I, I think... We, we are making progress, but it's still a long way to go. I noticed at the CMI Women's Conference that I watched that you had Trevor Phillips talking about some of these issues and the progress of race relations um, in Britain. Uh, and whilst we have an ethnically diverse prime minister and that cabinet looks um, as though it's a diverse, I'm not quite sure that we're still getting down to nitty gritty because, you know, the ethnic uh, ethnicity pay gap reporting still isn't compulsory we need to sort that out gender pay gap the reporting is in but there are no punitive measures let's not forget and it's getting wider that's with the caveat of lockdown and so on and so forth and the pandemic but still we all wanted to build back better and i do think we've got a long way to go and if we're going to come out of you know bank of england tells us we're in recession we need everybody contributing to growth in the economy and that has to include women minorities neurodiverse, you know, absenteeism, an older population. I've probably steered away from the, the question you've answered, uh, you've asked me, but we need to include all those people 
if we want growth in the economy. And so race and women in leadership are high, and I don't think we're, we've done enough. I think we should celebrate them, but not over the top. Yes, well, I want to pick up on actually the point that you made toward the end there about linking um, a diversity and a sense of belonging and including people to economic prosperity. There is a lot of evidence that suggests that is true, that if we have um, a, a diverse uh, uh, teams and diverse executives and diverse leadership, and those people are allowed and encouraged to express their diversity and be themselves, that organizations achieve better results and we prosper more economically. And indeed, uh, given the skill shortages we have, you made the point rightly that we really do need these people in our economy if we're to prosper and grow. But do you think that's widely accepted and understood or do you think we still have some way to go to get that messaging out there? Yeah, I'm afraid it's a re that's a great question. I, I think, you know, it's the old McKinsey report, right? I, I often sound like I'm talking about the moral arguments. Actually, I'm over that. I'm talking about the bottom line. I'm talking mm -hmm. about money. You know, I'm talking mm -hmm. about economic growth. So I do think it's understood, but we've got lots of cultural issues that prevent us from fully embedding it. You know, if we've got a candidate, uh, a, a recruitment exercise, and 10 of those people are from ethnically diverse backgrounds or BAME, which is a term I don't like because my experiences as a black professional woman are different to a Muslim woman, uh, mm -hmm. will be different to a Chinese woman and so on and so forth. But if you have a, a pool there and the 10 uh, of those people are the people most suited to the job, employ them. The unconscious bias or whatever the, the names are, or all the studies that show running me trust, I've done all these studies about names, prevent people from being recruited, even though the best candidates, so on and so forth. That should not prevent the, that pool from being employed and conducting the jobs accurately and leading to growth in the businesses. And whilst all the data tells us that, uh, and all the data and research says that, I think there are still cultural nuances that actually just mean that people are more comfortable recruiting in their own images and thinking ridiculous things like, you know, women will be off having babies all the time. They are, but they can still do their job. And it's not all the time. It's offering <laughs> a choice, right? That's it's opportunity. Right. So it's a great question because actually I work in evidence. The evidence should show us that we should be better at recruiting. Our economy should have everybody contributing in order to facilitate economic growth. But I think there are still cultural nuances that mean that that message just doesn't quite get there. You know, and there has never been, for example, an ethnically diverse judge in the Supreme Court. It's 2023. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that it's is quite amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but, you know, you mentioned cultural nuances. Obviously, we've, um, and you did mention COVID. Now, um, we have done some work at CMI uh, on hybrid workplaces. And what we found there gets at some of those nuances that shows that generally speaking, speaking, um, both younger and women and men and parents really did welcome uh, hybrid working. But yes. as we go back into the offices, it is more typically um, the senior men going back into those offices, it is more typically the women who actually do want um, to continue to work in a more hybrid fashion. And there is concern that uh, women's promotional opportunities will suffer because they're less present. That's one of those cultural nuances. There's also been concern that the biggest advocates for going back into the office are those whom office culture benefits the most, which tend to be the more senior, usually white men. Yeah. Um, now, do you agree with that? And what would you like to see happen in terms of the way we work to maximize a, a, an inclusive um, uh, workplace and um, managerial workforce? Yeah, I mean, that that's a very big question. Um, uh, and I, I agree and disagree to an extent. I agree um, that those who are, the hybrid work and those who are pushing it are a much more senior generation. Um, and I agree that actually the issue of presenteeism, it's an important issue, Anne, because when we talk about progression 
and leadership, it will mean that those who are not present will not be recognized for their working efforts. So mm -hmm. presenteeism physically in the office will be rewarded more so than the kind of hybrid working because of, it will be classed not entirely as absenteeism, which is a different issue. But I think there will need to be a, quite a clear distinction. Managers need to be thinking about how they do the appraisals, what is appraised, and what that actually means. Now, where I disagree is this. Le young people, uh, Gen Z, if I may say so, uh, I've got two issues, okay? They don't want to work five-day weeks in an office, right? And they I find it's easy to leave a job where you're just on a screen all the time, right? And that's not just in my sector. We know that because they want to be brewing beers, doing triathlons, and so on. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? So side we, hustles. Side <laughs> hustles. That side hustles, which we never had, right? So I get that. However, I'm concerned about training and development of young people where we have far too much maybe hybrid because there's a lot to be learned from learning from others in a workplace environment, observing how things are dealt with. You know, I don't just mean going to the water cooler or having a cup of tea, those machines, but actually there are conversations that take place. We know, for example, that a lot of business is done after dinners, you know, after dinner. You know, men are there with their business cards and they follow up and they network. You know, we women are like, we're knackered, we're off home. Gosh, you know, we've done the important bit of attending the networking or the dinner event and then we're off. Actually, most businesses, uh, most business is done post events in the night drinking culture, which is some of the, some of the issues that uh, some of our Muslim colleagues talk about, that it's not inclusive and we need to think about. So I, I do think for younger people, we need to change some of this, uh, the hybrid working, because there is a lot of learning from physicality in the work environment. You know, learning how deals are done, learning how mergers and acquisitions are done. I don't propose to say acquisitions and deals need to be done at 3 a.m. and require mm. people to over you know in lawyers offices i think we can work around that a different argument but i think from a, a training and development point of view we do need a better hybrid way of allowing our young people to learn about the workplace and work workplace culture which isn't entirely dependent on hybrid working teams meetings and, and so on so that's where my disagreement comes from because i think that learning that um people are receiving now on the junior end in whatever sector will be skilled by the pandemic. You know, there's a large number of people who've just been trained through screens, through mm -hmm. TV. And that's just weird, mm -hmm. you know? And, and and in my sector, as some of the law is a people business and you, one does have to be present and learning from others. So that's the only aspect that I disagree with you. But I am concerned that if women are the group staying at home enjoying the hybrid um, working, then they won't be rewarded or promoted in the same way. And that's something that I think managers need to be very conscious and aware of and think about the training and engagement. And I know that you, Anne, at CMI and your team have been doing lots of work about that. Yes, and I want to um, pick up on that uh, uh, question about actually getting more and better trained professional managers into the workforce. Um, because we know from our work at CMI that we have surprisingly close to 8 million managers in this country. The vast majority, especially in their early years of management and leadership, have never have been promoted without having any management training. So we call them accidental managers. Um, and, um, and so what, you know, what would you like to see to address that? What do you think employers should be doing to make sure that they don't have accidental managers and indeed that they're progressing diverse cohorts um, i'm talking here more about sponsorship what yeah. would you like to see employers doing to address these issues well three things because i've got three children so i like things in threes uh, mm -hmm. uh, firstly i think we need to have conscious managers so that means actually say right you've been identified very early on that may be from sponsorship or mentoring or, or whatever, which I'll come on to. So we need to have conscious managers who you can see and then make sure they go on courses. And I'm not just talking about, you know, there's so many courses now for everything. I'm talking about leading courses based on proper research, vast mm -hmm. amount of uh, development, so that there's professional, proper 
continue professional development for those managers because accidental managers, not all, end up in a tribunal faced with cross-examination by the likes of me, right? Or uh, uh, acting for a respondent company where I've got umpteen managers for days on end. It's expensive and it's preventable. So that's what I'd like to see. Secondly, I'd like to see in most companies, ment we talk often about mentorship, but every employee should have a mentorship or a buddy uh, in the in the company. So someone senior, whether it's reverse mentoring, it doesn't matter, but we should have mentoring and sponsorship. And I think we should discuss leadership. So where we've got early signs of leadership, we should marry them up. Again, maybe a buddying system, but let's f look at what that might look like for that individual who might be a minority, who knows, who might be from a working class background or a, a low socioeconomic background. You know, one doesn't know. I notice on the degree apprenticeships that quite often there was a lady I met who was an apprenticeship in John Lewis. She was mm -hmm. an older lady and uh, she'd had quite an interesting early career. And I was thinking she is like leadership material. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of person should be, just be on a trajectory then to see how she progresses and then be forced to then sponsor or mentor a younger person so then you've got outcomes and you can measure the outcome and the impact because then you don't then have accidental managers now you can have accidental managers who are sometimes great okay but they need training so the, those are the three things i'd like to see really i do think we need more mentorship i think we need more um, what i call buddying it's not an official term sponsorship but i think we need to identify well, as soon as people come into organizations, but the key thing for me is we need to have conscious, conscious um, managers, not accidental managers, where we're actually saying, OK, uh, you need to go on this course, which specifically is dealing with this subject. So you're equipped then to deal with the issue in the workplace, not kind of making it up as we go along, because we've got lots of policies for managers, but quite often they don't get a chance to read it, do they? So that's mm -hmm. how, you yeah, I'm, like, I'm forever saying in the employment tribunal, right, can you get me, you know, and I get HR manuals like this big, and I'm thinking, okay, that's not been embedded in the organisation. Nobody, <laughs> yeah, so you're absolutely right, and also you can't have a policy for everything. So much of this is about behaviours, right? Yes, it is. And those behaviours are down to um, how self-aware and often how self-confident, not overconfident, but self-aware and self-confident you are in terms of the impact of your behavior on others, right? Yes. Because so much of this and so much of good management and leadership is about the impact of behavior on others. And I'm sure you see that in your um, uh, 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 tribunal work. Yeah, all the time. And you know, uh, no one, no employer wants to end up in an employment tribunal or industrial tribunal as they were, or then end up, you know, in the employment appeals tribunal, which is the appeal court, or then end up in the court of appeal, which is then even higher. Nobody, nobody wants to end up that. But I do see that. You're right. A lot of this is about behaviours in the workplace. And you can't, you can't have a policy for, you know, kindness. You can't have policy for politeness. You know, There are so many policies, but... It, they need to be embodied in a recognition that certain behaviours have consequences. Um, and that, that matters a, an awful lot. Uh, because I was thinking about um, menopause, which we'll come to later probably, with one of my answers. You know, and, and I've often said that we need, like mental health um, first aiders, I feel like we need a menopausal um, first aiders. But actually that will only work if people want to go to that person, right? or make a disclosure in that sort of environment. So most companies in have got some sort of menopausal um, policy in their HR manuals, but actually the pragmatic aspects of it and the behavior is very different. You can't enter every room and say, do you want, your we do you want the window open? Because they've made an assumption. No, that's, that's, no that's, that's just not behavior that's accurate. However, you can ask in a different way in a, a more conducive environment if there's anything that the workplace can do to assist with anything that might be going on that's a much gentler conversation isn't it and that behavior is very different i mean i've chosen a very basic example there but certainly um 
I, I, you're right. I think behaviors are crucial in the workplace and managers need to be aware of it. Absolutely. I think that the menopause example is a great example. And you're right. So much of this is about um, decency, respect uh, and thinking, not necessarily thinking, how would I like to be treated? But how would the person sitting across from me like to be treated? Right. Yes. That so-called platinum rule. Um, people often say that's the difference between that's what really equity is. It's not the golden rule, you know, do unto me as I would like to be done unto. It's the platinum rule. I'm going to treat you as you would like to be treated. And if I think that way, I need to put some effort into understanding how is it that you would like to be treated? Do you agree yes. that that's a, a, a good um, a, a practice for managers and leaders to follow? I do because I've written it down. I never write anything down. Uh, I, I, I like that plat platinum rule because, you know, in court, I would have been saying reasonable adjustments, which just goes back to the Equality Act. And in the moment you say that, everyone's scared and runs away. You know, you can't be saying that in the workplace. Let's go to reasonable adjustments in the Equality Act. But platinum rule, I, I, you're right, actually. It's about the individual and how they want to be treated. Um, and I do think, and I know I've been banging on about growth, but I, I think that good workplaces retain good workers and we need them, particularly because of the economic downturn and a whole load of other things going on. So I do agree, actually. I rather like that. I want to call it PR, but... Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> well, I did not make it up, but it is a concept. <laughs> but what I have done is use it to explain the difference between equality and equity, right? Because the platinum rule is equity. Treat others yes. as they would like to be treated. Not yes. Don't project your values, your behaviors onto them and assume that they're going to be fine with that. And, you know, a lot of these um, behavioral issues that I'm sure you deal with come about because people assume from their own position, well, that's fine. I, I, you know, I didn't mean that offensively, but the person sat across from them may have a very different interpretation, right? Yes, yes, they do. Yes, they do. No, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, I really like that. Uh, and well, it does good. Work. Yeah, I'm going to coin it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, well, Sal, remember, you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, listen, I could chat with you all day, but I know you're a very, very busy person, and I'm so delighted uh, that you've taken the time out to share with us. But I do have my final question for you which is a question we do ask all of our leading issue guests. So if you were in charge, what leading issue would you want to be focused on? Let's just say you're in charge of the whole country, the government, the businesses. What would you choose and what would you like to be done about it? Oh, right. God, that is massive. Just one issue, one issue. This is it's June 2023. I can't choose one issue. Okay. Well, if you indulge me, maybe I'll be allowed uh, one or two, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are a number of issues. Number one, I've already said this in this interview, so maybe I'll, I'll not choose it again. Gender pay gap and the ethnic pay, ethnicity pay gap reporting. I think we need to report on that. Uh, it's a very simple practice the reporting but do something about the gender pay gap and have some punitive measures secondly i'd like to see menopause because this is you know often it's senior exec women who are then going through the menopause and then they're dismissed on capability and competence you know and so the symptoms of the menopause i think either need to come under the equality act as a disability because the law is unequal uh so in which case we can make reasonable adjustments or we need to point ping it under age discrimination but you know mm -hmm. even though i'm a lawyer and what i'm really very keen on is prevention of uh, is better than cure where you've got senior execs and senior leadership roles you know they've got a lot of skill i really don't want to see women then leaving the prof mm -hmm. professions having worked for so long so i'd really like us to look at the legislation and the support around the menopause and i'd like governments to see how we can use the law to do that either, as I say, as age discrimination or the making it compulsory for reasonable adjustments, which is what we're arguing. Now, I have got a third, if I may. But okay, you go on then. <laughs> a third leading issue would be finding a way to 
um, encourage and deal with the workplace issues. Firstly, racism, as the cricket reporters told us, but there's a variety of issues and people that we can embed in organisations better so that we can get the economy going. Neurodiverse people, they're a group, right? Because we know not all disabilities are um, visible. And neurodivergence, which is a, a term that I'm not comfortable with, but neurodiverse group, they're a vast amount of the population, the hugely talented, who are not always in employment because they're not managed in a way that that's, that's conducive. So I'd like to see governments finding more ways to encourage them. And I'd like to see apprenticeships being rolled out with equal credence and uh, popularity as everything else. Because, you know, lots of students now have debt. And apart from earning, is learning on the job. And so uh, they're another group that I'd like to see workplaces embedding and encouraging in more um, because they can contribute um, fully. And of course, my favorite topic, more women in leadership roles. Um, so I'm sorry well, I've gone on, but it's a big question and I wasn't able to just say one. Uh, that's fine, Sally. And in fact, what you've done there is an incredibly persuasive and eloquent summing up of our work on what we're calling the everyone economy. And if we did your very practical suggestions, which do actually get at, um, you know, making the law more accountable to encourage an everyone economy, I'm sure that we would actually um, get on the road to economic prosperity faster. And we'd also have more fun. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I really admire the work the CMI have been doing. And, and one of the work which we haven't managed to, to cover here has been encouraging the retirees. I call them the next generation um, mm -hmm. who are, you know, the grandparents on the school gates trying to get them back because they've got a lot of skills and they of course are a huge part of the every economy everyone's economy and i really like that word because i i am somebody who's anti-retirement i'll say it here um because i'm not sure what what i'll be doing with my brain uh, otherwise so i really like that recent word because i think that actually is a full closure of what cmi have been doing you know from the young to the middle to gender to race uh, and actually uh, and some of the other areas I haven't covered here, but I really like, you know, the next generation economy who are kind of the old EU retirees. So, yeah, um, I, I hope I I've covered everything. Um, Brilliant. Yes, you have indeed. And uh, long uh, here's to anti-retirement. Um, yes. I, I couldn't agree more. And actually, um, uh, that is a, also a focus of keeping people in meaningful work for longer and work that suits them and plays to their strengths. Sally, as ever, a tour de force and delight to speak with you. Uh, thank you for sharing with us and I will see you soon. Definitely. Thank you, Anne.